Good evening. My name is Victoria Waldron and I'm the Education Assistant here at the Albany Institute of History and Art. Thank you for joining us for the virtual program, Broadsides of the American Revolution. Before I introduce our presenter, I would like to remind everyone to please mute yourself. We will, later on in the program, have an opportunity for a Q&A session. We would ask you to submit your questions in the chat so that I can read them to Mr. Keefe. This evening's lecture will be presented by our guest speaker, Tom Keefe. Mr. Keefe is a political items collector, as well as a national authority on campaign buttons and memorabilia. He is also a volunteer at the Albany Institute, uh, where he has been working to catalog the DeWitt Clinton Broadside Collection, which will be the topic of tonight's presentation. When we are open and you feel comfortable and safe, uh, selected broadsides from the DeWitt Clinton collection can be viewed in the current exhibit, Fellow Citizens, DeWitt Clinton's Broadsides of the Early Republic. As uh, Diane Shuchuk, uh, our curator, was just saying, the exhibit has been extended to the 16th of May, 2021. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Keefe. Well, Welcome. good evening, uh, and I thank you all for being here. I appreciate—I particularly appreciate people being able to, willing to come out in the snowstorm that we're experiencing. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so the you know the Dewitt Clinton Broadside Collection, in a sense, was rediscovered in 2016, but the rediscovery. Um, was not sort of a traditional rediscovery because certainly the Albany Institute of History and Arts staff and other people associated with the Institute were well aware of, ex of its existence. The collection has been professionally preserved and well-maintained and is, is located in an extremely modern safe storage area that is easily accessed within, literally within minutes. Between 2007 and 2013, staff and volunteers created a 14-page guide to the collection, and that guide is online. Now, a limitation of the guide is that it, it has broadside, the broadside titles, the title lines, and, the, and that often tells little about what the broadsides are actually about. So, for instance, if you searched the guide, you would, it would not reveal that there's, there's broadsides supporting the election of John Jay for governor of the state of New York. On the other hand, the term rediscovery is appropriate because the true exciting nature of this collection was not understood by those who were aware of its existence. That year, the collection was discovered by a member of the broad community of his historians and collectors of American political campaign material. And he was able to explain to the Institute leadership the incredible unique nature of this collection. Prior to 1916, excuse me, prior to 2016, it was generally accepted in the collector and his history community that American political campaigns underwent a dramatic change between the period of 1824 and 1840, when the number of citizens able to vote rapidly expanded. And as a result, creating material objects promoting or opposing candidates and issues developed as a means of contacting the ever increasing number of voters. It was generally believed that prior to 1824, so few citizens were eligible to vote that political partisans had little or no need and there was no efficiency in creating things like a broadside urging a vote. Here in a collection of 94 broadsides that dates from 1775 to 1813, the majority, 56, directly relate to voting in an upcoming election. The elections include city council members, state legislators, congressmen, governor, lieutenant governor, president. In those days, many of the elected posts 
we take for granted today, like mayors and sheriffs and judges and attorney general, they were appointed rather than elected. As I said to the Institute curator, the day I first laid eyes on four political campaign broadsides, I'm looking at things that don't exist. The news rippled throughout the American political collectors community first, and then in 2018, the Institute allowed 16 broadsides to publicly participate in an American political item collectors event in Albany, which got widespread media coverage. The coverage and the media publicity within the collectors community changed the general knowledge of the history of early political material. The publicity also brought the information to the American history, academic and professional community with similar effect. I will not forget the phone call I received from Rob K. Haberman, PhD, associate editor of the selected papers of John Jay, who is the leading world scholar on John Jay. He tracked me down after reading an article about the DeWitt collection, and he excitedly asked me, quote, are you telling me that with your own eyes, you have seen an original broadside having to do with John Jay's run for governor, end quote. I laughed and I told him, no, I've seen six or seven of them. <laughs> um, Heberman has come to the Institute and reviewed the collection. He's written about the collection. He's lectured about it, including speaking, speaking at events relative to the current promotion of this um, exhibit. Along this line on the uniqueness of this collection, it, it, the collection contains three different broadsides supporting D. Witt Clinton for President of the United States in 1812. And this would be figure, the, uh, uh, the first picture, picture number one. Um, so, uh, so this is one of them. Um, prior to the, re the rediscovery of this collection, I was not aware of any contemporary material object other than newspapers that relate to Clinton's campaign for president. Since 2016, I've spent a great deal of time looking for early political campaign broadsides in private collections and institutions. And I have find, I found examples, but I'm not sure if the total number that I have found reaches the 56 that are in the DeWitt collection. I have found not one example of another Clinton 1812 presidential broadside. Oh, wait a second. No, that's not true because the Albany Institute has a separate broadside collection and they have three Clinton for president broadsides, including a duplicate of this one. <laughs> There is otherwise, there's otherwise mystery about the collection. How exactly it came to the Institute is not clear. It's believed it was donated by Theodoric Roman Beck or his heirs. Beck was an Albany physician, educator, author, medical, medical school professor. Beck had founded the Albany Lyceum of Natural History in 1823 and when they merged in 1824 with the Society for the Promotion of the Useful Arts and formed the Institute, Beck became the vice president. He continued to be intimate part of the Institute until his death in 1855. Now, how did it happen that Beck had the DeWitt Clinton collection? Clinton died suddenly of a heart attack in Albany at the Capitol after dinner with two of his four sons. He was 59 years old. I believe the children, his children were all adults, but young, just starting out in their careers. One had just started law school. Heavily in debt with, family have, with the family having no resources, creditors obtained judgments and all of Clinton's personal property was publicly auctioned. The collection of broadsides and other personal papers and scrapbooks would not in 1828 have had any value and would not have been auctioned. 
Institute records show that the Institute actually purchased some of Clinton's pamphlets at the auction. Now there was a large state funeral in Albany, but the family had no place to bury Clinton and his remains were placed in the family vault of Albany Dr. Samuel Stringer. 16 years later, the family had the body disinterred and reburied in Brooklyn. Stringer has long been referred to as an old friend of the Clintons. However, Stringer was a longtime prominent Albany politician aligned with Philip Schuyler, George Clinton's longtime political opponent. Nine of the political broadsides in, the, in this collection include Stringer as a participant in anti-George Clinton political activities. Stringer died in 1817, 11 years before DeWitt Clinton's death. He was 82 years old. So he may have made amends with DeWitt Clinton before death, but he certainly did not offer his crypt to the to the Clinton family in 1828. I'm guessing that Beck arranged for the burial, but it's only a guess. Beck was the longtime headmaster of the Albany Academy, where DeWitt's son, George, attended for four years. In 1825, George joined his brother, Charles, acting as his father's personal secretary. George had a lifelong interest in science, including geology and botany, both subjects very dear to Beck. And Beck's daughter married one of DeWitt Clinton's cousins. Sometime after the DeWitt's disinternment, the Clinton family asked Beck to write DeWitt Clinton's biography, and they provided Beck with, quote, a large and valuable collection of papers belonging to the family, end quote. Beck did write a brief biography preliminary to the full one, but then he died, then he died before he accomplished the bigger task. An assumption is that this giving of Beck papers by the family is how the broadside collection ended up with Beck. An interesting little tidbit is that in a speech that George gave about his father in 1875, he said among his responsibilities as secretary to his father, he maintained his father's scrapbooks. Now the concept of DeWitt Clinton, that DeWitt Clinton put together this collection of political broadsides and quote, is likely the earliest political material specifically assembled as a political collection, end quote, that needs to be, that needs some thinking and, and it needs some context. First, there needs to be an understanding that in 1828, there was no concept of hobby collecting, which began to flourish later on at the end of, towards the end of the 19th century. It's extremely unlikely that DeWitt Clinton was a collector of political campaign material. These items accumulated for some other reason. DeWitt was at his core a politician. It is said that he entered politics at the age of 21 in 1790 when he became his uncle, Governor George Clinton's secretary, where he remained until his uncle left the governorship in 1795. Then in 1798, DeWitt was elected to the New York State Assembly. The following year, he was elected to the New York St State Senate from Manhattan. In 1801, while, while serving in the State Senate, he was elected to the State Council of Appointment, the four-man, all-powerful government body that controlled appointments to government positions. The governor, John Jay, was a fifth member of the uh, council of appointment, but he only had a tie breaking vote. On the council and in the legislature, DeWitt was the opposition leader to John Jay. Jay left the governorship in 1802, and George Clinton returned as governor, serving until he was elected vice president in 1804, and then George Clinton remained vice president until his death in 1812. In 1802, Clinton, George, uh, DeWitt Clinton was elected United States Senator. 
but he only served until the following year when the Council of Appointment appointed him as mayor of New York. So 1803, a mayor of New York, and he was mayor of New York most of the period until 1815. He was briefly removed in 1807, reappointed in 1808. The Federalists briefly took control of the Council of Appointment in 1810, and then he was reappointed mayor in 1811, serving to 1815. Um, the, during the period 1811 to 1813, DeWitt was actually Lieutenant Governor of the state of New York while he also served as mayor of New York. Now DeWitt's uncle George had been elected governor in 1777 and he served three year consecutive terms for 21 years. George Clinton would become known as an anti-federalist in the battles over ratification of the constitution but in New York, he led a, the, the Clintonian political faction. Within New York's anti-federalist ranks, there were Clintonians and anti-Clintonians. At some point, probably around the time Clinton, George Clinton first stepped down as governor of New York, DeWitt Clinton became the de facto head of the Clintonian faction. Likely this collection was accumulated in, a, in association with DeWitt Clinton's political activities and for some political purpose. While 56 of them concern campaigns for office, 27 others concern political issues. Nine of the broadsides are not political. Two of those non-political broadsides are things that were specifically addressed to, to DeWitt Clinton as mayor of the city of New York. The other seven are diverse in nature without clear connection to DeWitt's political activities. One is from 1795. It's a very large broadside. And this is image number two. It's a very large broadside that seems to have been issued by Philip Schuyler to the stockholders of a corporation he ran that was developing canals west of Albany that was a precursor to the Erie Canal. Also relevant to the consideration of why these were accumulated is that four are from before DeWitt Clinton entered into politics. Three of them we're gonna talk about and show tonight are ones uh, that, that are from when they were produced when DeWitt Clinton was a very young boy. I also want to point out then with that when this collection was relocated within the Albany Institute in 1911, they, they were found in a closet in the Institute. The, the broadsides were bound into volumes where the, they, they were very, very carefully sewn onto pages. Um, it's, it's, it was, it was the broadsides were then removed from the volumes and it's believed it was done in the 1960s or 1970s and they were removed and they were conserved by staff of the Institute. What's unknown is when exactly they were first obtained by the Institute. And we also don't know if when they were first obtained, they were in those volumes or not. Um, the first, uh, uh, image number three is the first of the Revolutionary War um, documents, broadsides we're going to talk about tonight. When this was produced in 1775, DeWitt Clinton was five years old. It, this, is a, this one is undoubtedly produced in London. It is a speech in Parliament by William Pitt. He's known as Lord Chatham. Um, he was the British war leader during the Seven Years' War, which was the French and Indian War here in the United, here in America, here in the North, North America. In 1775, Pitt was a member of the House of Lords, and he supported the colonial position in the run-up to the American War of Independence. He sought to find compromise on the escalating conflict with the American colonies. His position changed from a, an obsession in 1774 with the question of the authority of parliament versus the king 
to later a search for a formula for conciliation to avoid war. This broadside is his speech to the House of Lords in support of his proposal known as the Provisional Act that would both maintain the ultimate authority of Parliament versus uh, uh, Parliament's um, sovereignty versus the King while meeting the colonial demands. The broadside contains four columns, the text, four columns of text. The first three are Pitt's speech, which is concluded at the top of the fourth column. The rest of the four columns is commentary, and the commentary begins, quote, Administ the administration appears to be startled at this fair and honest, candid and impartial representation, end quote. And then it continues with brief descriptions of the positions taken by other members of the debate, Lord Suffolk, L Littleton, Shef Shelburne, Camden, Townsend, the Duke of Richmond, the Marquis of Rockingham, and then Lords Gower, Rockford, and Weymouth. The broadside's ending reports that the motion to defeat Pitt's bill passed 77 to 18. That vote was on February 1st, 1775. Pitt's warnings regarding America were ignored. He called for no taxation without consent. He called independent judges, trial by jury, and for the recognition of the American Continental Congress. After the war had broken out, he, he warned that America could not be conquered. Due to this stance, Pitt was very popular among the American colonialists. Um, this, his high esteem approached idolatry, according to historian Clinton Rostier. The greatest of the great men of England, the last of the noblest of the Romans, was considered the embodiment of virtue, wisdom, patriotism, liberty, and temperance. Pitt, glorious and immortal, the guardian of America was the idol of the colonies. Now we're gonna to move to image four. The second of the revolutionary broadsides um, is dated June 2nd, 1775. It's American made. Now we all remember that the revolution started with the Declaration of Independence on July 4th, 1776. But the reality is that the war had been bubbling up for years. The Boston Massacre was in 1770. The Boston Tea Party was in 1773. In April 1774, Parliament revoked the Massachusetts Colonial Charter. In, and in October, Governor Gage implemented that act by, by closing down the Massachusetts Colonial Council. Patriots responded by forming a new independent colonial government. As, as, and as a result, war broke out at Lexington and Concord in April 19, 1775. This rippled throughout the colonies. In New York, a provisional state government was formed and convened on May 22, 1775. Peter Van Berg Livingston was elected president. He's the signatory of this broadside. Um, the broadside is an appeal to the inhabitants of Quebec. Its purpose is clear, to assure Quebec citizens that they have nothing to fear from the colonial provisional governments and that they are brothers and who should share in the same interests of protecting liberties and freedom. The broadside states that the New York provisional government has taken steps to secure forts along the border to prevent military attack from British troops in Quebec. Essentially, it's stating to the people of Quebec, don't worry about what happened on May 10th, and May 10th, 1775, when there was a raid by a false, a small force of Green Mountain Boys led by Ethan Allen and Benedict Arnold which surprised and captured Fort Ticonderoga at the top of Lake Champlain from a small British garrison. And the next day, the Americans captured a nearby Fort Crown Point. And then a week later, 
on May 18th, Arnold and a group of 50 men raided Fort St. Jean on the Richelieu River in southern Quebec, seizing military supplies, cannons, and the largest military vessel on Lake Champlain. The broadside specifically states that the council has also recently heard of an attack on St. John's, but assures Quebec citizens that such an attack was not authorized by the provisional government. It would appear that the provisional government could really not be trusted. On September 17th, American Brigadier General Richard Montgomery, who was himself a member of the New York State provisional government, laid siege to St. John's. And on November 3rd, Fort John fell, St. John fell, which opened a way for the Continental Army to march to Montreal, which fell on November 13th without a fight. From there, they proceeded to Quebec and, Qu Qu and Quebec was a failure. Montgomery was killed. Arnold was wounded. Many, many soldiers were captured. The rest of them flee, fled haphazardly um, out of Canada. Um, the, uh, the, now this, to be fair, that attack was, was, was done on the auspices of the Continental Congress, not the New York provisional government. But bottom line, um, the colonial revolutionists um, had virtually no support from the citizens of Quebec. The next broadside, uh, number, picture number five, um, is from October 3rd, 1778. DeWitt Clinton would have been nine years old when this was printed. Um, the war had been waging for about three years. There had been little progress to an end in sight. Early in the war, the British were quite confident that the re rebellion would be very short lived. Their attitude never changed despite Washington's drawing the conflict out by successfully avoiding direct large scale battles that would have surely hastened the Patriots defeat. Then in October of 1777, something remarkable happened. Uh, a comprehensive plan involving the influx of massive numbers of British troops was laid to bring the war to an end. Its object was to split the colonies in half. New England and New York divided from the middle and southern colonies. Three British armies would converge in Albany, one moving south from Quebec via Lake Champlain, one moving southwest uh, via the Mohawk River from Ontario, and one up the Hudson River from New York City. However, the British plans unraveled uh, with only Burgoyne, the, 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 with the forces, the troops from Quebec, making it as far as Saratoga. Among his problems was the abandonment of his uh, forces by Native Americans, allies, after a loss at Bennington. The Ontario and New York City forces were delayed and never made the rendezvous. The British defeat at Saratoga changed Britain's perception of the war, um, as well as the perceptions of British enemies like France. Very fearful that the, of French recognition of the American independence, Prime Minister Lord North had Parliament repeal the offensive measures like the Tea Act and the Massachusetts Government Act. He sent a commission to seek negotiation, a negotiated settlement with the Continental Congress. This peace commission marked the first time the British government agreed to negotiate with Congress. The commission was empowered to offer a type of self-rule that Thomas Paul Nell had first proposed a decade before and that would, be, would later form the basic foundation of the British do, dominion status throughout the world. The offer included parliamentary representation the commissioners arrived in the colonies on June 4th of 1778. The Second Continental Congress was aware of British troops' plans to abandon Philadelphia. And as a result of that, they demanded full independence and the commission was not authorized to grant full independence. 
The sides communicated, but little progress was made. One commissioner, George Johnstone, was caught trying to bribe members of Congress. He was forced to return to England in August. Then the remaining commissioners began making plans to leave, but before their departure, they issued this proclamation and manifesto to the American people directly, and it was widely um, circulated. The manifesto addresses all the steps that British had taken to bring peace and to grant the colonies the bulk of what they were they wished. It also attacks the, the proposal of an alliance with France, and it discuss discusses in detail the horrors that will be um, inflicted upon the colonies if peace is not made. This manifesto offers a pardon to anyone who withdraws from the rebellion and sets a deadline of 40 days, which would be about November 11th. It's a, it would be a pardon for individuals or for whole militia groups. The commissioners um, ended up returning to England at the end of November, clearly unsuccessful. This failure of the Continental Congress to engage in the peace process is said to be the impetus for Benedict Arnold abandoning the revolution and joining the British forces. Um, he basically, he effectively accepted this offer of pardon that was made in this broadside. So other than those three broadsides, all relating to the revolution, the next earliest broadside in the DeWitt Clinton collection is a non-political broadside from Philadelphia. This would be image number six. This, this broadside is from 1783. It, it relates to the formation of an Irish fraternal organization. <clears throat> then after this broadside, there is actually 12 broadsides from 1789. They all have to do with the governor's race between George Clinton and Judge Robert Yates. Five are pro Yates, seven are pro Clinton. This would be the year before DeWitt is said to have entered politics. Um, although since George, George Clinton returned as governor because of the, you know, because of the 1789 election, and thereafter young DeWitt became his secretary, it seems likely that DeWitt was involved in the highly contested race for governor and may well have obtained these broadsides contemporaneous to the campaign. All the remaining broadsides in the DeWitt Clinton collection come from the period between 1790 and 1813, a period where DeWitt was engaged as a leader of the New York Clintonian political forces. Obviously, he continued to be consumed by political leadership for the rest of his life some 15 more years. Why there are no broadsides saved after 1813 is part of the mystery of this collection. So now we're gonna to move to one more broadside. It's not part of the DeWitt Clinton collection. The last broadside, image number seven, um, it's, it's dated October, 1777. It's titled Authentic Intelligence Just Arrived from the Northern Army. This broadside is in the Institute's broadside collection. Its, its, its contents are in two parts. The first is an extract of a letter from an unnamed gentleman in Albany dated October 9th, 1777. It describes in detail the October 7th Battle of Saratoga, including the specific exploits of Benedict Arnold and Benjamin Lincoln. It details the routes of the Burgoyne forces and his army's retreat to Schuylerville. The second part of the broadside is a brief extract of an October 15th, 1777 letter that's, that says it's from headquarters, which, and it describes the conflict at Fort Montgomery in the lower Hudson Valley, where General Henry Clinton was delayed moving his British forces north to meet up with Burgoyne. This broadside was printed in last, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, by the famed printer Francis Bailey, who was the first printer of the United States Constitution. He's also the person who first referred to in print 
to George Washington as the father of his country. This broadside was printed on the very day that Burgoyne surrendered to the American forces. Now I had this broadside pulled out of the Institute's collection to add to our discussion tonight, even though our discussion tonight is really about the DeWitt Clinton collection. But the reason I had it pulled out is because this broadside is just too good to be true. Too, it's just amazing. So that is um, the pre presentation uh, for this evening. Again, I wanna thank you for you all braving the storm and coming out. I think we're gonna open this to some questions. I'm happy that the, if you have not yet been able to come and see this magnificent exhibit at the Institute, I'd urge you to do that because it's really great. We will be doing some more programs like this, discussing other um, portions of the DeWitt Clinton Broadside Collection. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Keefe. And I do have a few questions um, that have come up throughout your presentation. The first one is what changes led to the expansion of voters between 1820 and 1846? Well, um, I mean, you know, uh, people, uh, people demanded the right to vote and they pressured um, their elected officials to increase the franchise. Um, in, in, uh, in New York, it, 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 the, you know, the only people that could vote were certainly white males, number one, and, but you, you had to uh, own, in every state, there were property qualifications for voting. So in some states, the property qualifications were higher than, than others. So in New York state, the, the, the constitution of New York state was was uh, ratified in 1777. It was drafted by John Jay, and it it provided for um, uh, to to vote for governor. You need needed to uh, your the prop the value of your property needed to be at a certain level. You could vote for state legislature with a lesser property level, but it was a specific value. Your property had to be valued at at least X amount of dollars, and that valuation included, I mean, the, um, if there was any mortgages against the property, that lowered your property valuation. So, as a result of that, um, you, you, you know, your bottom line is if I, the estimations is that three to four percent of the of the of people in New York State in 1777 had the right to vote. Now. Interesting, and I'll get. I may. I may get far afield here. Um, the Constitution allowed tenants of the patrons. They. 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 They, just, they made tenants of the patrons. They described them and and defined them as property owners. So in the in the Hudson River Valley and up to the Albany area, a much higher percentage of people could vote because tenants in, in the, the, there weren't these patroonships, there weren't these tenant farmers south of, of uh, uh, Columbia County, um, certainly New York City, Long Island, and, and the, you know, the, the, the rest of the state was part, sparsely settled. The bottom line is your basic workers in New York didn't have the right to vote but tenant farmers upstate had the right to vote. So there was a lot heavier, a lot, a, a lot higher number. And the, and the patroons used that to their advantage relative to um, uh, the, the, the patroons sort of controlling votes. And there's, matter of fact, in this, um, in this collection, there's a broadside that, that is supposedly produced by tenants of the, of the Albany patroon um, or the Rensselaer Patroon saying these stories that our votes are controlled by our Patroon are not true. He's very good to us and he doesn't tell us how to vote. We vote the way we want to vote. But, um, but uh, so the thing is that there was, there was political um, maneuvering to go on to increase the vote. There were politicians who sought to their advantage to increase the vote. And so you saw from from the from about 1800 
to about 1824, you saw the, you know, like every year or two, you saw the doubling of the number of vote. And after 1824, the same thing happened. I don't know the numbers off my off the top of my head, but if a hundred thousand, you know, in the, in when when uh, when George Clinton first got elected governor in 1777, there were five candidates for governor. He won a majority of the votes. There was only a thousand voters in the entire state of New York. There was only about a thousand voters. Um, by 1824, there was probably 30,000, 40,000 voters. And probably two years later, there was 80,000 and then 200,000. And then, you know, just, it went up by massive, massive, massive numbers. Uh, so Thank you. Um, I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. Um, we also have a question. How widely distributed um, would some of the broadsides uh, specifically the Adam one you mentioned, would how widely distributed would they be? For instance, well, how many yeah. would have been posted throughout Albany? Um, yeah. God. Yeah, so I, I get the question and the answer is it's not known, but I can tell you extremely small, right? I mean, here's the thing is that, um, you know, these were, the, you know, the, the, the reason we call these broadsides and not posters is because they were made on printing presses where the printer put, you know, set this type. Every single letter on the broadside is a separate piece of type that was put into the printing press. And so years later, as we develop different types of printing methods, um, these, th th we, now, we then started calling them posters, not broadsides, but this, these broadsides are set by type. So there's, it, it, they, you clearly wouldn't just print one. The question is, but you probably didn't print a hundred, right? And so the answer is, I don't know the answer, but we're talking about very small runs of these things, very small, maybe 10, 20, 30, right? Maybe some more, but very small runs. And um, do you know anything about the printers who produced these? Uh, if they were promoting the American cause, did they risk imprisonment? Hmm. So the answer is, I don't know a great deal about that. I mean, the bottom line is some of some many, many of these, there's there's no identifiable printer. Right. And in many of them, there's identifiable printers. Um, one of the really interesting things about these is while, while a lot of them are from the Albany area, they also are from, and from New York City, but they also are from all over. They're from Erie County and Steuben County and Long Island and Columbia and Ulster and Dutchess. And so, I mean, the thing is the, the you know, the, the, the fact that they are from all over the place is fascinating because obviously, or right, we, DeWitt Clinton wasn't traveling all over the state of New York, right? I mean, the, the, uh, at, at, you know, at, at, at some, you know, the, the Capitol was originally the, you know, when with the, the Capitol, the, the constitution of the New York state was ratified in Kingston, New York, because they had fled um, New York city because the British occupied New York City throughout the Revolutionary War, um, and they fled New York City, they ended up in Albany. Now, after the war was over, the uh, the the capital moved around a little bit, but pretty much was in Albany all the time. And so, you know, the 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 New York City politicians like Dewitt Clinton, George Clinton, Dewitt Clinton. Well, George Clinton was actually from Ulster County, but uh, Dewitt Clinton was from New York. And so they would they would travel up to Albany, but they certainly would would rarely or never travel through Long Island or tra travel to travel to Erie County, right? So bottom line is these these are from all over the place. Um, you know, the, I think that the it, I, my understanding of the war is that the um, the you know the British were in um, occupied portion, they occupied New York City, they occupied significant portions of, of New Jersey, they occupied, 
They occupied uh, Philadelphia until they fled in the middle of the war and the, and the Patriots, you know, controlled Philadelphia for the, for the majority of the war. So the, the, uh, the British forces tended to be in cities. Um, Albany was, was always, you know, the, the British never occupied Albany during from the, the whole gist of the war. Some of the major, you know, Philip Schuyler, uh, was one of the major leaders of the revolution, and he was from Albany. And, and so, you know, I think that Albany printers, for instance, could be very comfortable um, doing what they wanted to do without repercussions. And then, you know, New York City printers could not do what they wanted to do in the middle of the war because they would have been, um, they would have been arrested, right? Uh, thank you. Do you know where Dr. Samuel Stringer is buried? The answer is that's a good question. I, I sort of thought about it. I'm assuming, my guess is it's probably in the Albany Rural Cemetery because that's where almost everybody is buried. And I think the Albany Rural Cemetery um, opened in 1813. So I don't, but I do not know. How did the fact that the Patroon's tenants were counted as property owners uh, for voting affect the claims for ownership when the patroonship was eventually dissolved? Well, um, I mean, that's a, uh, the, here's the thing is that the, they, they, you know, uh, John Jay was married, his wife was a Livingston. Um, so John Jay wrote a constitution that was pro these big patroon landowners um, and, uh, and it had, a, it had, a, you know, it had a big effect on the early, uh, history of the state of New York when virtually no one could vote, but basically higher percentages of people. So here's a higher percentages of people in this, in this area could vote. We're still talking about almost nobody being able to vote. Right. Um, but here's the thing is, you know, we went through this whole 30 year period which are called the rent wars, right? I mean, that's a, that, that's a significant revolutionary um, uh, movement to, to um, expand people's right to vote and change the whole voting process, right? We, the, the rent wars led to modifications of New York state law where judges were no longer appointed, they were elected by the people because the people wanted to elect judges who would not put protesting renters in jail, right? So, you know, New York State is one of, the, one of the handful of states in the United States of America where our judges are elected, not appointed, because originally all these judges were appointed and the tenants wanted freedom. And so we, there was, you know, there was revolution, there was revolution. And uh, so the, the, you know, the thing is that the, the, you know, we are in the hotbed of, 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 of where America made massive changes in how governments are operated. We're the, we are the seat of so much of that here in the, in the capital region. It's really fun. It's really fun. Um, I do have a few um, other questions. Let's see what we have. So um, it seems we have a question about the, the pronunciation of DeWitt. Is it DeWitt Clinton or DeWitt Clinton? Or, mm. or how did uh, Mr. Clinton himself pronounce it, I guess, is the, is mm. the question. I apologize. I really don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Um, and we do have a few questions. Um, when did broadsides stop being used? Huh. Well, I mean, in a certain sense, I don't, and they probably in a certain sense, never, you know, because I think there are still people out there that utilize printing presses, probably not really much. Um, but uh, the thing is that, you know, there was, as, as the industrial revolution happened, new forms of printing were developed that were more efficient, more, less expensive. And, uh, and, you know, so I would say, you know, I, let me tell you, as a political collector, um, I can say that you 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 started you st you started to see lithography 
probably lithography as opposed to printing presses starting in the 1850s, 60s, 70s. So probably broadsides dissipated at the, you know, at the end of the 19th century. And, you know, certainly probably, certainly by the 1890s, everything was being done by lithography, not printing presses. That's my, I'm not a, this is, you know, I'm not an expert on this, but that's based on my knowledge of political campaign material. <laughs> Thank you, excellent. And I think we just have two more questions. Um, were broadsides used to publicize songs or dances? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, let me tell you, broadsides, um, they were, broadsides were utilized for, for the vast, I'm sure that the vast majority of broadsides had nothing to do with politics, right? So broadsides were made when, when a ship was coming into the Albany Harbor from London or from Liverpool, right? Um, and the ship was coming in to, to bring China and cloth and stuff. The local merchants would, would create broadsides saying, here's the ship. We expect to get a shipment in on Tuesday of, and they would list all their stuff and they would list their prices. So um, uh, broadsides were mostly produced for commercial and economic reasons. So certainly um, entertainment, absolutely. I mean, the, you know, broad, uh, broadsides for, for plays and traveling minstrels and that kind of stuff, meetings of fraternal organizations, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 I believe that the Institute has a very famous runaway slave uh, wanted uh, reward poster in their collection from, you know, the, the early 1800s. So, you know, the, the vast majority of, of the broadsides that were created um, were not created for political reasons. They were, they were created for probably mostly commercial reasons and social reasons, absolutely. And remember, so these things were printed. They were printed in small numbers. They were printed, you know, they were printed to say, vote next week. They were printed to say, we're getting a shipment of goods in next week. They were printed to say that, you know, because of foreclosure, the property of Joe Smith is going to be auctioned off in, in, at his, on the front steps of his building next week. And so there was, there, there, there was no expect, you know, this stuff would be printed and put up on walls and then would be thrown away, right? Thrown away. They were, this stuff was not made to be kept. They were, they were made like newspapers, right? And, um, uh, and, uh, and so it's sort of remarkable that any still exist, but I've been collecting political material seriously for 50, more than 50 years. And I didn't believe until four or five years ago that there was any such thing as a broadside, political broadside between, before 1824. And here are 40, 56 of them in one collection. So they were, you know, they were somebody, he kept them for some reason. You know, somebody kept them for some reason in this particular case. Great, thank you. Um, so it uh, looks like one last question. Um, in relation to the collection, do you have any information about James Clinton, DeWitt's father? Hmm. No, hmm. Um, I do, listen, I, I'm, I don't believe James Clinton's name appears in any of these broadsides. Now, my, my catalog at this point is like 300 pages and I can, I can uh, uh, you know, I can put James Clinton in that and see if I'm wrong, but I don't believe James Clinton's name is in any of these um, broadsides. I don't remember how old DeWitt was when James died. I think, I don't really know, but I think James died when DeWitt was somewhat young. Um, uh, I think certainly James was dead by the time that DeWitt at 21 became his uncle's uh, personal secretary, but I'm not 100% sure of that. So I do not believe any of these broadsides mentioned James Clinton. 
All right. I, I think that's it. I think you answered some of the other questions that we had um, while you were speaking. So once again, I do want to thank you so much uh, for this presentation. And um, we appreciate you giving us this opportunity. I do just want to mention um, if anyone would like to see um, images that you can manipulate and make larger, um, please send me an email. You should all have my email address. Um, but it is Waldron V at Albany Institute. Um, if you would like to be able to see those lovely images up close. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice night.